הייתי מוקדשת לשלוח את זה, ואז גיליתי שהסינכון בין הסאונד והזה הוא לא, הוא לא היה נכון, אז התחלתי את זה, וזהו, אז כאילו, התשנתי את הדקה וחצי הראשונה, לא, זה לא עובד, מתקלקל. מה זה? אה, מעולה. זה מתחיל לבד, כאילו? אבל מה אם אין אף אם העברתם את זה ל-11 חזרה? דאגנו שזה יעבור ל-12. תתחיל. that you probably all, uh, most of you know. Uh, Lee was here for many years. He uh, graduated about eight years ago. Mm-hmm. And since then, she's in Weizmann Institute. Uh, shifted. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, I, I, I was just saying that um, this is where I gave my uh, talk of the, my, at the end of my PhD. So it's, coming back, and it was after the renovation, so that's kind of exciting. Um, okay, so I'm Lee. Um, I'm currently at the Weizmann Institute. I'm working with Shira Rubin, which I think you, most of you also know, um, and we're part of the Dynamical Meteorology Group, um, and I'm going to talk today about um, the formation and the impact of Australian wildfires and kind of from a synoptic dynamical um, outlook. Uh, I'm going to show you a few case studies, a few um, studies that we've been doing, and hopefully they're, they're going to show you that they point to um, a few dis- different aspects so, um, of the fires and the dynamical systems um, as well. Um, so I'm, in this talk, I'm going to talk about two different uh, case studies or two different subjects. So the first one is the spread of the wildfires in Southeast Australia, um, and kind of, kind of, um, kind of looking at what causes a uh, wildfire to become from a, um, to just a regular wildfire to an extreme wildfire to spread uh, into very large areas. And the other one I, I want to talk about what happens to the smoke that is formed from the fire. So kind of the connection to synoptic systems and I'm going to touch on, on that um, in the second part of the talk. So I'm going, to talk in, I'm going to talk here about extratropical cyclones mostly and dry intrusions which I'm going to introduce in a second. And I'm going to show you throughout, um, throughout everything that I'm going to show you is the, the strength of Lagrangian airstream analysis, which is um, something that we've been using a lot. So, um, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just start. So this is an extra tropical cyclone. This is a very classic um, an image. This is uh, Great Britain there in the middle. It's in the Atlantic. It has this uh, comma shape that is very, um, it's very, very excited. <laughs> uh, so it has this very classical uh, two-dimensional shape, and you can see the cloud formation around it. But what we need to remember is that um, an extratropical cyclone is actually a, a three-dimensional object or a three-dimensional creature. So it has these really large ascending and descending airstreams. So we have this warm, what is called a warm conveyor belt, and these are all kind of a cyclone-relative airstream. So if we look at what is happening around the, the cyclone itself. So this warm conveyor belt, this red part here, is really strong ascending motion um, that moves up uh, behind the, the warm front. And it has a lot of precipitation, convection, formation of clouds. All of this is happening on this side. I'm not going to talk about that side. Um, I'm going to talk about this side here, and this is a dry intrusion. This is uh, descending air streams that are coming all the way from the troposphere and reaching all the way down to the surface behind the cold front that is located here. This is dry air mostly, um, and I'm going to talk a lot, a lot about it. We have different airstreams also. We have this cold conveyor belt that uh, flow very close to the surface. We have a sting that just kind of forms here. And all of these, all of these are you know, the subject of a lot of research and you know, still going on everywhere. Um, but it's, a, it's kind of a, a view of this three-dimensional structure that we have, and I'm going to come back to the, this all the time. I just uh, one more thing, we're going to talk about Australia, so everything reversed, okay? So everything, <laughs> circulation is going that way. Uh, warm conveyor belt is coming from the, from the north. Um, DIs are mostly coming from in Australia from the coast of Antarctica. And um, circulation is going uh, clockwise. Okay, so the first part, I'm going to talk about the role of descending airstreams. Um, actually, uh, of descending airstreams. 
um, and how they relate to the spread of the large wildfires. So just uh, gen in general, Australia is, you know, is a very fire-prone area. It's a very fire, um, especially southeast Australia. If we want to look for extreme wildfires, we will look for hot and dry conditions. We look for really low relative humidity, uh, strong winds, rapid wind change directions usually um, are related to the spread of fires. And there really is a, a very classic fire weather um, scenario. So it usually has a low pressure system to the south or southwest of the continent, a high pressure system to the east, and usually another high pressure system that's not marked here on, uh, to, the, to the west. And all the systems are kind of moving from west to east. And when this cold front passes, it's a really an indication of the spread of the fire. So there have been a lot of studies on historical large fires in Australia. And they found um, all kinds of features uh, that are associated with really extensive fires. So um, it can be a temperature gradient at 850 hectopascal, um, Rosby wave breaking, so some upper, stru upper level structure, um, PV anomalies and something at the surface, so like extreme surface drying that comes in like these pulses. And all of these have been associated to historical uh, large wildfires. And there was a really big paper um, by Reader in 2015 uh, that connects the largest fires into for, to very extreme cold fronts. So it kind of puts them, these two together. And when we were looking at all of these, these are kind of very indicative of dry intrusions. Okay, so these are kind of, they're all kind of, can be existed, can, can exist or can relate to dry intrusions. So what are these dry intrusions or how it, can we define them? So as I said, they're descending airstreams. They're slantwise descending airstreams along isentropic surfaces and they, they descend from the upper troposphere in the higher latitudes uh, towards the equator, behind, usually behind cold fronts. So if you can see this three-dimensional scheme, so this is the dry intrusion and it's coming behind the cold front that's here at the surface. And that's kind of the structure. And a lot of research has been done in the last few years, um, and even more. Um, we know that these dry intrusions are related to a lot of extreme events. So we know that they're related to stronger fronts and really strong surface winds, uh, cold temperature extremes, dust storms, um, precipitation extremes. This one is in the monsoon area, and actually um, a really strong relation between the dry intrusions and the monsoon rain. Um, and we have. And we know that it also, has, it also affects the boundary layer. So it's also reaching the surface and causing a change in the boundary layer itself, destabilizing it and uh, changing its height. So all of these, and so you know, <coughs> we, we thought, okay, they look like dry intrusion, but we weren't the first. Um, so there, there have been a few studies. This, these are only four, usually looking at stratospheric intrusions, the ones that are coming from the stratosphere and usually bringing some high ozone concentration to the surface. So, this first one was a kind of a study that was looking at, a, at um, the location of these uh, intrusions and, and um, the measured surface, measured ozone surface near the, um, measured ozone at the surface near the fires, sorry. Um, some dry slots on satellite images uh, that also indicate this paper is actually a kind of a, a warning or an advice for firefighters to start looking at satellite images also uh, because they indicate the spread of very extreme fires. Um, some cases in the U.S. and some um, upper-level structures. And all of, these, all of these studies, what they have is an Olarian view. So they look, at, they look at the satellite image, they see where the fire is, they kind of try to connect both, they look at the upper-level structure. And what we wanted to do is use a Lagrangian approach. So we wanted to, put, to actually look at the air masses as they're moving from the top of the troposphere all the way down to the surface and see what's happening to them. So we, we started with, with just kind of comparing the databases that we have. So we took um, 41 fires from the last 40 years that are really the biggest one. And we saw that almost 80% of them have a dry intrusion event, a very strong dry intrusion event that happened at the same time. Okay, so that gave us kind of, that was sort of the starting point of the, of the research. Um, so I'm going to show you one study. Um, in the paper we have another one and we actually um, that, that was published. Um, so we're looking at the Black Saturday bushfires. They happened in 2009. There's a very research, very, um, um, very large fire. It lasted for over a month and there was uh, many casualties in really extensive areas. If we focus on the meteorological aspects, it was in the warm sector before the fire started. It was one of the most extreme heat waves to date. I think even, the, um, even in the last fires in 2020, the heat, which had a really large heat wave, 
they didn't reach this, uh, they didn't reach these uh, temperatures, so this is really extreme. And after the passage of the cold front, um, what we actually got is a cold anomaly that was in the 1% of the coldest, um, the most extreme cold events in the area. Uh, this is from ERA-5 data. Um, and this contrast actually led to one of the strongest temperature, uh, one of the most extreme cold fronts. So this cold front is a, had a drop of about 20 degrees after the passage of the front, and very, quick, very quickly it dropped. Um, so this was a good, a good uh, case study for us. So what we wanted to see is what leads to the formation of the extreme cold front, and what causes the strong anomalies before and after. So why, why did they happen? Um, we were, were using Lagranto, which is what you can see here. So these are um, back trajectories that started from, in this case, back tra backward trajectories that started from near the surface, about 100 hectopascals from the surface. Um, we're running them for 96 hour backwards using ERA-5 data. And what we're doing is we're looking, so here they're colored by pressure. This is the, the bluish colors are near the surface and the reddish are higher up. And what we calculated along each one of the trajectories is the potential temperature anomaly. So we, we took a, a very simple approach and we looked at the deviation from the monthly climatology and calculated the potential temperature anomaly at each point along the trajectory. And this is just, I'm gonna come back to this in a second, but this is time, so this is starting from, from the left here. And you can see that as the cold front progresses, the anomaly at the end of the trajectory increases and then decreases as the cold front passes. So we're kind of getting what we want. But before that, let's look at the synoptics. So in the Black Saturday fires, it was a very classic fire weather uh, system. So we had a low pressure system, so this is Australia and the target area, a low pressure system here and a high pressure, both two high pressure systems on both sides. And, um, sorry. And when we look at the trajectories themselves, we see that we have two very distinct flows. So we have easterlies that are coming um, in the lower levels in this bluish color, and they're coming um, towards the area. And we have westerlies that are descending. So these are starting from the higher levels and descending towards the surface. Both of these, um, regardless of where they're coming, they're all bringing positive anomalies to the area. So all of these are contributing to the really extreme, uh, to the extreme temperature that was measured at, um, at the time. If we kind of jump towards the, um, uh, to after the, the front passed, we can see, we can calculate the trajectories again, and we can see that actually the, um, the trajectories change direction, so this is what we would expect. Um, um, and we can see the dry intrusion kind of, um, we kind of found it in our back trajectory, so we have the trajectories started descending a lot here, uh, more than 400 hectopascals, which is our, our definition. But what I can also tell you is that there's a lower level flow. So underneath these dry intrusions, we actually have low-level flow that's going near the surface, and it's going to play a very important role. And both of these, these flows are bringing negative anomalies to the surface. So um, these are both contributing to the negative anomaly that was seen after the cold front. So now that we have all these trajectories, and we calculate them for about a week and a resolution of every three hours um, from the same starting point, we can look at, the, at each one of the trajectories and try to identify what is the contributing factor to the change of the, to the potential temperature anomaly. Okay, so um, again, we define the potential temperature anomaly as a deviation from the climatological monthly mean. That's on the top. And if we look at the difference between the origin and the target, just the, the potential temperature on both sides, we can, um, we, find three we can identify three different features. So we have some sort of an initial anomaly that would be here at the origin. Um, some transport of cl different climatology, so we're going from here to here, we're directing air in an adiabatic form, and there's some sort of diabetic change. So it says diabetic heating, but it can be heating or cooling, actually. So um, some, some diabetic change. And we want to see is what, what is the relative contribution of each one of these, um, each one of these uh, parts. Is this supposed to be a Lagrangian uh, temperature, like to form a specific particle? Yeah, so we're following the air mass. Yes, so it's a Lagrangian, it's a Lagrangian anomaly. So at, at each point, and we're seeing along the trajectory. It's Lagrangian, why is there a climatological influence? So, so, it's coming, so it's coming from the definition of the anomaly. So we're oh. defining the anomalies, and we're basically just, it's a very simple um, subtraction of the two, and then kind of arranging it. So we do have some sort of transport that in, it's in there. And because we're looking at potential temperature, 
um, it, it kind of stays. So there's adiabatic uh, transport there. So now we have, these, um, we have these components and we have these trajectories. And our next step is we can look at each time step, we can look at the relative contribution of each part um, um, to the trajectory itself. Okay? So this is an example of this time step that we saw before, before the cold front, where there are two types of streams, the easterlies and the westerlies. And each one of these bars um, represents one trajectory. Okay? So we sorted them by uh, delta p, by the, so that's the red dots here, we kind of arranged them. And we, we also marked the, tem the potential temperature anomaly. So as I told you before, the black dots are the potential temperature anomaly and they're all, the, they're all positive in this area. Okay, so all of them are, uh, both, both of the streams are contributing a positive temperature anomaly. Sorry. Um, what we can see is, is that the contribution is very different from the two airstreams. So if we start with the, the ones that are hardly descending or even there's a little bit of ascent near the, near the surface there, um, we can see that the main contribution is the diabetic change. So some diabetic heating because of the air flowing near, near the surface. First near the ocean and then, um, and then uh, above the surface itself. And this, that's the main contribution fa contributing factor. But in the, the descending trajectories, we see that first there is transport of very warm climatological air. So the air is coming from warmer regions. Um, there's some diabetic cooling and some sort of an, a small initial anomaly at this time step that is actually contributing to the positive anomaly. I'm going to come back to it in a second, but if we look at the, if we look at a time step, uh, the second time step after the cold front passed, we see a completely different picture. Okay, so now again these are sorted by the delta p, and we can see that there's a very strong diabetic chain, diabetic heating again for the for the trajectories that are coming close to the surface, this low level flow. And actually, in the, in the descending trajectories, which are the DI, we mostly see a negative anomaly that's being infected into the area. And this is, if you can, I'll, I'll show you, okay. I'm, sorry, I'm gonna skip it in a second. Um, so now we have, we have these plots for every single time step, so every three hours for about a week. Um, and what we did is we averaged everything, okay? So we average each time and get this one bar. Okay? So one bar for each time step. And now we can look at the evolution of the, of, the, um, of the front itself. So see what happens and what is the average contribution of each one of these, um, each one of these uh, time steps. So this is what you see here. So each bar now represents an average of all, all um, about 80 trajectories that we have in each time step. You also have here the, pretend, the anomaly and the delta p marked here. Okay, so we'll break it down a bit because the figure is a bit crowded. So we'll, we'll start with the warm sector. So the warm sector is the left side of this figure. And we can see that, first of all, I have some, I keep moving, I have some text. Okay, so, um, so first of all, all the anomalies are positive, as I already said a few times. So we can see in the upper plot that um, all of them are above the zero line. And we also separated them to, by color to east and west. And we can see that actually a lot of the, um, uh, the most positive anomalies are coming from the, from the west, from the descending trajectories. Um, and, <laughs> sorry, um, okay, what else we can see is, is that there is a contribution of all three different parts, okay, so there is some sort of transport that's coming um, of positive air that's coming uh, towards the area, there's a diabetic heating and some diurnal cycle that we see here, and a very strong positive anomaly that's being infected into the area, and you can see it uh, coming up. If we put it in sort of a schematic, and this is a this is the climatology of potential temperature in the east to west kind of cross section along here. So we can identify a few streams. So we, can, we have this low level flow that's mostly a diabetic contribution, and we have this descending flow that's mostly advection and some sort of a positive anomaly from the initial positive anomaly. When we saw this positive anomaly kind of popping up in there, we went, into the, we went to literature and we found a paper in 2013 that talked about that um, the heat wave that was before, sorry, that the heat wave that um, appeared here before the fires was actually, the air was preconditioned by tropical cyclones that existed in this area. So they talk about a, a warm air that's being infected into the air also. And it was really, it was really nice that we kind of <coughs> found it um, from the trajectories themselves. That's it. Okay. Um, now if we go to the cold sector. Um, so now we see that everything kind of changes. So we see, um, we, see, we still see the positive 
um, diabetic changes, okay, so positive diabetic contribution. And these are from the low level flows. And now actually they, what they do is they balance this really, really cold um, transport of the air um, close to the surface. So this part here is mostly a contribution of the diabetic, of the low level flow that's going underneath this, uh, um, underneath these trajectories. What is the contribution of the dry intrusion is mostly the negative anomaly. And the reason is because, because we're looking at potential temperature and um, dry intrusions are mostly vected along isentropic surfaces and along equal potential temperature surfaces, what we don't mostly see is just the anomaly from the climatology. Everything else doesn't really change. So if you kind of put that in a schematic diagram, so now it's a cross-section of north-south um, along the climatology, we would get something like this. So we have this low-level flow that's, um, that's being warmed as it goes, um, so it's very cold air that's being warmed as it goes towards Australia. And we have this um, cold anomaly that's being infected towards the surface, increasing the cold air, that, increasing the cold anomaly that's already arriving uh, to the area. Now, this cold anomaly that we see here, um, also, we kind of found that in a, um, some other papers that, are, that were looking at teleconnections regarding this, um, this fire. Okay, so they found also, um, when looking at even a larger scale, they, they found these uh, cold anomalies above the coast of Antarctica in this paper, which really coincide with, with the, the origin of our trajectories. That was really nice. Um, so if we put both of them together and kind of, kind of see what, what pops up from, from all of these trajectories and all of this analysis, is that the descending trajectories are actually really important both in the warm sector and the cold sector. So we, we started off by kind of looking for the effect of, of dry intrusions and only after the cold sector, but, but the descending air streams are actually bringing warm anomalies in the, in, the case of, in, the case, in the warm sector itself and actually increasing the warm anomaly that's seen at the surface. And after the cold front, they're bringing cold anomalies. So these are two descending air streams that have very oppos um, opposing roles. And the, another thing is that all of these are kind of working together. So this is a very extreme case of, of the, um, where all three contributions, the transport and the anomaly and, um, and, the, and the diabetic change, are all working together to cause these anomalies on both sides. Um, so as I said before, we're seeing this. So in the paper that we published, we have another, another case that, um, that's completely analyzed with all the, all the figures and everything. But when we we're looking at the database, we see this behavior in a, in a lot of fires. So, a lot, um, so about 80% of the fires um, show this, uh, uh, the, same, uh, the same behavior. So this is a, a really strong connection. And, and, and um, it kind of led us to, to, to think about, OK, so we picked Australia because it's not a very, it's not a very, um, uh, the climatology of dry intrusions is not that high there. So it's kind of, okay, so this is, could be a good uh, area to study. But then we said, okay, but if, you know, if we're looking at fires, we really need to look at California, which is another fire cone. But in California, there's also a hotspot of dry intrusions. So it kind of mess, it kind of complicates the statistical, statistics a lot more. So we started off with, um, I had Idan, which was, a uh, high school student that came to do a summer project uh, from one of the, from the Alpha projects, and she was absolutely wonderful. And what she did is she looked at, she took a, a fire database uh, for, um, and extracted only the fires in California, and can compare that to the DI uh, database that we have. So she kind of did a very simple statistical comparison, and at first we were looking at it, and it's like, okay, maybe this is too complicated and there's nothing there. But then when we started looking at the numbers and split into month, we see that in the autumn, the percentages, and we're talking about 13 and 15 really extensive fires. So these are the, the largest fires uh, that you could find in the database. Um, all of them have dry intrusions. So they, they, all, they all coincide to really large dry intrusions. So we actually have a student that started um, about a week ago, um, and he's going to look more into, more into this and kind of try to understand why there's a hot spot of dry intrusions in that area and also what is the connection to wildfires, and if there is. I'm not, not really sure yet, but we'll see. Um, OK, so that was kind of the part one. Um, and the second part is sort of a, a side project that kind of came up, and um, where we wanted to look at what happens to the smoke after the fires. So um, in this case, I'm going to look at extratropical cyclones. Again, I'm not going to leave those. And, 
and kind of see how they influence the flow of the smoke and how it really. So, um, so in uh, Black Summer in, the, in January 2020, um, the Southeast Australia had really catastrophic fires. I, I, everyone knows about them. I'm not even going to, I didn't make, prepare a slide with all the, you know, all the numbers. I'm just going to assume that everyone kind of knows what I'm talking about. Um, what I do want to show you is, uh, so a paper by Ilan and Hirsch, um, Koren and Hirsch, uh, they, um, uh, they showed, um, it's not really seen here, but what they showed is, so this is the UVAI, this is a uh, UV aerosol index showing um, aerosols that are only located in the stratosphere or upper troposphere. And what they showed is that, so this is, okay, this is longitude here and this is time. It's really the, sorry about the labels. Um, and what you can see here is that, is that after the fires occurred, there is a change in the UVAI in the whole hemisphere, the whole southern hemisphere. And what they showed is that after the spread of this um, increase in the, the spread of the smoke here that you can see here, it actually affected the entire uh, southern hemisphere. The, another interesting thing that happened in this fire is, and there are um, a, a few other papers, is that a, um, a smoke blob or a smoke bubble kind of formed above the fire. So east of New Zealand, um, they saw in the stratosphere a, a smoke bubble that lasted for a few weeks, after even, even months I think they managed to uh, find it. It was rising and rising because it was a self-sustained system at a certain point and it reached all the way up to 35 kilometers and it was traveling to North America and then it moved back and they were kind of tracking it. To, it's, uh, and we were kind of interested in, in what happens from here, from the fires themselves and how we reach the, the smoke bubble. So kind of these two. And the, our, our interest kind of started with, um, with these Calypso screens. Okay, so Ilan and Oritz showed us these screens and said, okay, so we have smoke identified in the upper levels, and that's over there, but there's also this feature. And this feature kind of looks like a slantwise ascending smoke. So why would smoke ascend slantwise? So we would expect, you know, pyroconvection going straight up, maybe some <coughs> latitude float, but this was kind of peculiar. So that was kind of the, <laughs> that was kind of the start of the, of the investigation. So we wanted to see what causes the slantwise ascent, and we wanted to know where and why the smoke entered the stratosphere because we know from the bubble that it, it was there and it's not here, so it wasn't there. And once we started investigating, we kind of wanted to know if this is just something that is very random and only happened once, but, or maybe this is something now. And, um, okay. So we're looking at the UV aerosol index, as I said before in the, in the, um, in the picture. So the UV aerosol index is sensitive, it's, very, it's transparent to anything in the troposphere, it only shows you the aerosols and the smoke that's in the stratosphere or in the uppermost level. Um, you can see, I, I just missed it because I was talking, but you can see the smoke here increasing. Um, so this yellow bright color and you can see that the smoke is kind of moving from Australia and moving around there. If we look at just snapshots, and this is um, the same index, Okay, plotted, so we're starting from December 31st, January um, 1st and 2nd, and we see that the smoke is starting from the coast of Australia and kind of moving, um, moving towards New Zealand, and then after it passes New Zealand on January 2nd, something happens. Okay, so it's moving in this like, nice little blob, and then something happens and it changes direction. And even so, and even continues, it goes a little, even a little bit north there and kind of circulates around something. And this was, uh, um, and so this was kind of the first evidence that there is some some interaction with the system that um, exists. There. So what we also see here is so this is the UVAI. What we also see is the minus two PVU line. This is um, an indication of the dynamical tropopause. So we'll just consider it as sort of the interface between the troposphere and the and the lower stratosphere, or the tropopause itself. Okay. And so we're seeing that in the beginning. It's flowing really nicely along the along the line of the um, along the line of the of the wave, or along the sorry, along this contour, um, and it's from the north side. And this indicates that it's not really in the stratosphere yet. Okay, so it's somewhere in this interface level, but it's not really in the upper upper stratosphere. And if we we can plot these two PVU lines, and I'm I'm just going to use them in, as a tool, I can plot them at different isentropic levels, and they kind of indicate the height of of the smoke, and we can isolate them and to see that, okay, so if we have this 330 line and then the 340 and 50, so it's somewhere in between these levels. So it's not really 
you know, it's not, it's not in the stratosphere, which would be this kind of uh, grayish area here, but somewhere in the middle. And the, uh, and the core pillars are, are quite clear. When we, go, uh, when we go to January 2nd, where everything kind of changes direction, we see that the, contour, the different contour lines are not that so clear. And this really is an indication of some sort of vertical ascent or some sort of change in the height or some change in the isentropic levels that is not, that is not indicated, not, let's say, um, fits the regular climatology. So we kind of wanted to see what happens there. Um, so we'll start with the synoptic system again. Um, so we're looking, so what happens here is that um, on December 31st, this is Australia here in New Zealand, there is a tropical storm, uh, a tropical cyclone that's located here. The coloring is the equivalent potential temperature. So you can see that it's very humid and you're going to see the, I don't, I'm not sure you can see the colors. And there's a stationary extratropical system that's formed here and it doesn't move. If we go one day forward, the um, tropical storm actually moves into the mid-latitudes and uh, transitions into an extratropical cyclone, bringing a lot of moisture and a lot of energy into the warm conveyor belt part of, of this stationary system. So this becomes a very deep low and still remaining at the same place. Um, the final stage is that these two converge, um, and we also have some upper-level structure from this, uh, from this wave breaking here and we get this PV cutoff, what is called the PV cutoff above it, indicating that we have a tropospheric wide system. So something that's coming all the way down from the trop troposphere, and you can see the effects all the way down to the, to the surface. So we went back to the trajectory analysis, and we took this one place where we saw the, some vertical motion or something happening, and we calculate forward trajectories and backward trajectories from the same location. And we take, um, we take you know, the entire troposphere, the entire atmosphere, so from 800 to 5 to 50 hectopascals, every, we have 16 levels in between them, and we calculate all these tra trajectories. So these are, of course, too many, so we only select the ones that, at the end of the 72 hours here, um, are located above 300 hectopascals. So only the ones that are actually ending up, let's say, in the UTLS or in the, upper, uh, in the, in the stratosphere itself. And now we, what we can do is we can take these selected trajectories and look back. Okay, so we can look at the origin and split them into different origin, um, different origin um, locations. Okay, so we have four different categories. We have the stratospheric ones, so which are not moving that much. I'm, I'm going to leave them in a second. Um, and we have these high trajectories here and these middle trajectories here that are both kind of coming from 400 to 200 and above 200 um, hectopascal height levels. So that's their initial uh, place. Um, these are coming all the way from the coast of Australia. So these are kind of, we would expect these to advect the smoke as it's coming in the uppermost levels. What we also plot here is the potential verticity, um, and that's the color of the lines. So if we have um, colors that are changing from this uh, yellowish colors, which are tropospheric values of potential verticity, that would turn into the bluish colors as they enter the stratosphere. And we can see that these middle trajectories are actually doing this transition. Okay, so they are going from one to another. Um, and the last, the, last, um, uh, the last one is actually um, trajectories that are coming all the way down from the surface. So these are in 24 hours, they're actually rising all the way from the surface of the ocean all the way up to the troposphere and even entering the stratosphere. And that's a very, that's a very um, uh, strong, um, very strong and very fast uh, ascent. Um, okay, so if we kind of, so we can put this in something that moves. Um, uh, so we're, now we're looking only at the three different uh, sectors. So each one is marked by, uh, by one of the markers. And we can see the UVAI kind of imposed on them. So, we're not in the trajectories, we're not calculating the movement of the smoke. So we're only, the only thing we can do is look at the movement of the air and kind of impose the smoke on it. So now it's starting again. So these are the lower ones. You see the, um, the ones that are coming in the higher levels and the one in the middle levels. And the interesting thing is, is that here everything kind of mixes. So this kind of indicates that, again, we have this upward motion or, or some sort of vertical motion that kind of mixes these really nicely flowing uh, levels. So to see this vertical motion, what we needed to do is do a cross-section. So we need to look at the vertical cross-section along this very, uh, um, um, 
very deep low. And that is what you, so the green line is the cross section that you see over there. The colors are, um, the colors are the potential vorticity. So the magenta line kind of gives us the barrier between the tropospheric air and the stratospheric air. And because of this, um, because of this uh, PV uh, cutoff and this PV structure, we have a very deep dip in the tropo, in the tropo, tropo pause height. Okay, so it's coming in all the way down to the surface. What we also have here is the, not, uh, to the middle of the troposphere side. So what we also have here are the trajectories themselves. Um, and these are the same trajectories that we saw. And, and we mark them when they, are, when they arrive close to the cross section itself. So this is on January 2nd, when the smoke is kind of arriving around, this, uh, around, around the slow pressure system. But if we move a little bit further, um, still on January 2nd, so this is um, 0 UTC and 9 UTC and 21. And we can see that because after they circulate this motion, they're kind of aggregated inside the, um, the PV cutoff or inside this dip that we have in the, in the tropopause height. And after that, we even, even kind of accumulate more and ascend towards the top. So we're kind of, we call it kind of a scoop, but basically what happens is that because of the circulation, the smoke is kind of, well, scooped into the, into the, into this dip. Um, when we saw this, we were like, okay, so maybe, you know, this, we saw it because we were tracking the smoke. I mean, we didn't think that this is what we would find. We're kind of looking for, you know, some nice warm conveyor belt like the ones that we saw and kind of, um, you know, just kind of entering the stratosphere and that's about it. Um, and when we looked at this, we were like, okay, but these systems kind of happen all the time. And if you... This is a climatology of these really deep cutoff flows that you can see in, in this area. Um, so in the southern hemisphere, and this is all year climatology, and this is summer, and you can see that in the area of about, yeah, about here. Um, they're, not, they're not rare, so they happen all the time. And, and because, because we were tracking the smoke, because we were kind of following to see how it entered the stratosphere and how it formed this bubble, we found a, um, a mechanism that can actually lift a lot of air, tropospheric air, into the stratosphere. And it's something that's really mess missing in the balances between the troposphere and stratosphere exchange. So we're kind of, um, um, yeah, sorry. Um, I don't remember what the last sentence was. Sorry. Okay, so, uh, so, so it's, it's a... Smoke follows air particles. Smoke follows air particles. Air follows smoke particles, and you can go either way. Um, but the, I think the main thing is that we kind of set out to, to, to find something, you know, a very type specific case of just what happened to the smoke here. But the mechanism itself is something that we were just weren't able to see it before because we didn't have the smoke kind of highlighting it. Um, this kind of got us interested in general in, in like um, the effect of cyclonic systems and, and extratropical systems on the flow of smoke in general. And we're kind of looking for... Uh, new options, and, and a new option came in last year in uh, June in 2023 when New York was covered in smoke. It was like, it was about three or four days that you can see, you can see the Statue of Liberty, you can see the Empire State Building, and everything was just kind of looked like this. Um, so we have, uh, we had, it was a combination of a few um, student projects that we had, and a few rotation students, and what we did is actually try to find where the smoke came from. So we're using the same trajectories, the same sort of analysis. Now we're actually tracking the smoke, which is a new improvement. We're using COMS data. Um, and we're kind of trying to identify where the, the smoke to New York came and what are the synoptic systems that are uh, following it. So I don't have a lot of results to show you because we're putting them together right now. But I will show you this animation here. So this is the aerosol optical depth. Okay, so not, not stratospheric, not anything. Uh, coming from the fires. And I think we're going to... I think we just missed it. Okay, so this is the two PVU lines. So this is the, the wave breaking, and you can see this uh, um, uh, the split. New York is located here, and it's going to come back in a second. But you can see the smoke of the, the fire smoke, really using the um, um, the wave guide as as a, a way to follow the as a way of flowing. Okay, so as long as it's in the troposphere, it's really controlled by the synoptic systems. And what we can see here is, I, again, we just missed it, is that there's a very big low, uh, very deep low that forms near New York. And again, it kind of carried the smoke into the New York region and kind of kept it there. Okay, so this, this condition kind of lasted, I think it was about four or five days. 
um, that the smoke was just kind of confined on New York City. It made them very unhappy. Um, so yeah, this is kind of a future uh, thing. I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping we'll have more, uh, you know, organized results really soon. Canadian fires. Sorry, I didn't say. Yeah, I've been looking at it for a few weeks now. So uh, there are really extensive wildfires in Canada, and basically around this area and here. So all of this line was filled with fires, and just the smoke was kind of flowing. And it, because it wasn't, there are a lot of small fires producing a lot of smoke, so they remained in the troposphere and kind of flowed straight into New York because of the sun. Because there was a big low level here and a, a, a high pressure system uh, off the coast so of. They so they didn't go very high, but they did go, you know, they ascended a bit and descended on, yeah, but they did. They descended on New York. And so the, what we found is that the origin wasn't from the, really from these fires. This was just a uh, minor contribution. There were a lot of fires along this line also. So they ascended just a little bit. You know, it's not as dramatic. But because there was a, a very hot, large high pressure system to the east, it kind of blocked the path of the smoke. So it didn't go anywhere. But, you know, you found a, a little bit, you can see a little bit of smoke in Greenland and some other places, but it really didn't move anywhere. Um, so that's really cool. I'm hoping next time, soon, uh, we'll have many more figures on all of this. Um, okay, so just to conclude what I was saying. <laughs> so, um, so this is the second part. So we, we, were looking, we were tracking the smoke, and we were kind of trying to see why the smoke entered the stratosphere and where it ent entered. And what we found is that the smoke first la traveled laterally um, along the, tropo the top of the tropopause. So these are the, the middle trajectories. And once it reached the cyclonic system, it was kind of scooped into the, into the stratosphere and was pushed up uh, to the location. And actually, the, the location of the bubble that was first um, seen is right above this system. Okay, so this was kind of the first place that it was located. Um, and, it, and this kind of situation highlights a very possible uh, mechanism for troposphere to stratosphere pathway or uh, transfer. And in Southeast Australia, when we're looking at fronts, which seems like years ago now, um, uh, we saw that uh, descending airstreams are important on both sides. So both in the warm sector, they bring warm anomalies and increase the warm, uh, the warm temperature at the surface. And cold, in the cold sector, they bring cold anomalies and um, actually bring, uh, increase the cold temperature. And that all three contributions, the transport, the diabetic, and the initial anomaly, all contribute to this one extreme case of, uh, of uh, everything uh, together. And uh, thank you. That was so many words. Thank you. They're pa published here, and if anybody wants to read them. <laughs> Asaf. Not so much, uh, I have to admit. We came with a dry intrusion, uh, kind of seeing if dry intrusions are. Um, not so much. I don't, I don't have a good answer. I, I'm, but I, I know they are associated. I, the, um, the paper from 2015 that associated uh, strong uh, cold fronts, they, I think they found an even higher association of the really large fires and, and the cold fronts. So, um, you know, sometimes a dry intrusion you know, it might be, not be as descent. I mean, our database sets it at 400 hectopascals in 48 hours. So maybe it was 380 and it doesn't fit. So we never checked it because we actually didn't get around to it. But it's, um, but yeah, I'm assuming there's some sort of, some sort of um, uh, descending airstreams there also. Really? Yeah, because it influences the circulation somehow. I have no doubt. I mean, it's uh, it definitely, and this amount of smoke definitely has. I know I I haven't seen it, but I'd be happy to, to see it. it. We know that the the smoke once it enters the stratosphere, there's a, a few papers that talk about how it 
how it influenced its own flow. So it, it warms and it, in, it uh, ascends. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, this amount of energy and yeah. this amount of heat would definitely change, uh, <coughs> change the entire... Because uh, often you would get the cyclone downstream of... Downstream of a smoke. It's really interesting. I would to see it. In the dry intrusion? No, 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 the warm conveyor belt. The warm conveyor belt, it ascends. Yeah, yes. So, here you have, you have so, so this is the other side of the front. So if we, so we have uh, ascending motion in the, uh, behind the warm front, so in front of the cold front, basically. So we have war ascending air there, and we have descending behind it. So it's kind of a, okay. a two-way motion on, on both okay. sides of the cold front. Okay, so, 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 so the warm conveyor belt is, is well off. It's well, it's well, and it's disconnected from the, yeah. So uh, definitely there are, I mean, they, they do influence each other, so the, yeah. the, entire, the entire, the energy of the entire system, yeah. but they're basically different flows, and they have very, very different properties. Mm -hmm. um, so how often is that to have, like, this disconnected? I mean, I, I, I'm not a so that, this is, like, the basic um, model, okay? So this is, like, the ideal model, what I showed here, so we have all of them, um, and they happen in all mid-latitude cyclones, yeah. but their intensity is quite different. So you have, um, you know, so not all cyclones have really strong dry intrusions that we can identify in our database or um, not a very intensive warm, supply, uh, warm conveyor belt. And so the, the magnitude of each one of these flows changes between the extratropical cyclones themselves, but they all, they all yeah. exist. They all can. So there's like the 41 you identified. Is there something, I mean, something about how, how, like, so, So what they so the forty one so okay so um, so what we have is a, is what we kind of maintain a dry intrusion database that is set on the four hundred hectopascal uh, criteria and from all era five data for the last forty years and it's maintained forty years every three hours in forty eight hours forty eight hours so oh, sorry. So, 40, so we keep we maintain this database. So this initial check was kind of just with this criteria. So I think that if we use, um, as I was saying, if we use like a different criteria, something a bit, I'm assuming we would find it because it's still a mid-latitude cyclone and it still it has still has the same structure. Um, this Black Saturday fire was a really extreme case and it's really well studied, and because of its extreme case, it had these extreme contributions from all of them. So it was a really good way to 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 you know, separate the different effects. But I think they all exist in some, some sort of way in all the fronts. Yeah. Um, regarding the upward uh, pressure uh, transport of the smoke, so it yeah. should happen in the cyclone, mm -hmm. so that there was some sort of vertical dipole look like that. The, the smoke entering? The, in the, in the, you've shown like a vertical plane, right? Yeah. It was like a, looked like a very, like in the yeah, is it this one here? Yeah. This one? Yeah. Okay. This one? Uh, on the left, top left, is that vertical? No, so, so this is the, this is the two-dimensional. Uh, yeah. So we're just doing this is the cross-section. So what you have here is the cyclonic system here, the low-pressure system, and the PV cutoff at the top. So that is actually the cross-section here, and the PV is marked by this. So the, there's a very strong dip in the tropopause, where um, above cyclonic system, okay, and the tropopause is very weak here usually um, because of the structure itself, and and it just kind of allowed this easier passage of smoke or easier passage of air, and what we actually think from these trajectories is is, is sort of um, and sort of kind of collect. I have this image in my head of kind of collecting all the air around and pushing it up, and because we saw the smokable really above this. Okay, so right above it, I'm kind of, I have this image of uh, something pushing it up. I don't know, I, I kind of stopped here, 
Um, <laughs> but, but yeah. Yeah, um, and I mean, this deep in the, in the, uh, um, I suppose, uh, that's, it's an abnormally large deep? So not really, not really. So PV cutoffs in really deep sequence systems, they usually